The Dice Tower, episode 602, De Joueur. The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. This episode is sponsored by Renegade Game Studios. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. In today's show, Mandy talks a lot of two-player games, including our app, and we get real about our so-called friendship. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Mandy Hutchinson. Wait, wait, wait. I just had to talk about your your <laughs> your French there. Le titre en français, c'est bien. I'm, I'm impressed. I'm sure Merci our, beaucoup. Yes, our French listeners will also be very happy. So that's <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, that four years of high school French is really paying off now. <laughs> and wait a second. What is this about our friendship? <laughs> Mm, I don't know. We'll have to wait until the end of the show. Oh, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Some of y'all getting kind of sassy in your questions. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> well, welcome back to the podcast, everybody. It is The Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games and most of all the people who play them. Mandy. Yes. I have been seeing some notes online about people complaining that they're not going to be able to play games on a boat. And I'm very sad. Oh, could we potentially be talking about the love boat? The love (laughs) boat. (laughs) Not not that boat. Well, I do love games. Oh. If that's the kind, that's not the kind of love. Is that the kind of love you're talking about? Okay, so we must be talking about the cruise. Okay, I got you. (laughs) So for those of you who are interested in the Dice Tower cruise, which of course, my biased opinion is it's awesome. You may have seen that it sold out very quickly. And if you haven't seen on the Guild or or whatnot, don't panic yet. Jason's working very hard to secure a few more cabins. There is a wait list. Things happen in this schedule all the time. So definitely, if it's something that you want to try, jump on the wait list. Don't give up hope. Keep an eye on it. Okay? So that's, I just wanted to, you know, fingers crossed because we want as many people to be able to join us as possible because it's a fabulous gaming event. Absolutely. But I'm just recovering from Arizona Game Fair. Even, you know, it was a it was a quick convention over the weekend, but it still tired me out, all those games. Now, you're headed to Ottawa? Ottawa? Ottawa. Ottawa. Yes, just Ottawa. Like, I find it's so funny hearing people who don't live here. They're like, Ottawa. Or when they say Toronto. Oh, no, we're not that proper. Ottawa. (laughs) Ottawa. I guess I could pronounce it all different ways. All different ways. We'd know. The capital of Canada. Oh, some trivia for you there. (laughs) So Vancouver's not the capital of Canada? Oh, my ears are bleeding. (laughs) (laughs) Quebec? Come on. Oh, no. So, all right. I am having a few conventions that I'm attending or kind of mini events. Well, Ottawa Comic Con is bigger than a mini event. That's not coming up till May 10th to 12th, but I will be roaming the halls uh, with a friend who actually is uh, also with media. And uh, believe it or not, I'll be playing some games when I'm there. So if you see me, come by. Let's sit. Let's chat. Let's play some games. And then Can Games is coming up on May 2-4 weekend. So that is our Victoria Day weekend, if I'm not mistaken. I do not believe that is a holiday in the States, but uh, well, let's take some time off and come down to Can Games in Ottawa. And it's all about playing games. There's a lot of different types of games, RPGs, you just got your, you know, regular board games, anything you want. But there's also some war gaming that happens too. And some of the uh, the structures and whatnot they have are amazing. So a nice, diverse kind of people that you'll see there. So I think that's wonderful. So I will be there for that entire weekend, weekend volunteering. I'm doing air quotes, which just means I'm in the library so I can play games with lots of people. <laughs> so nice. That's my, yes, my Way to secret. work it. Of course, I'll be there. So hopefully you'll see some of you there. And I'll do a little reminder when we get closer to the date. Cool. And uh, if you've noticed, I've interjected something into our notes there. What? What is, what, are you just bragging now? What the heck is this? <laughs> I'm so excited. Okay, so it's not game related. I'm sorry. So you can just close your ears for a minute if you don't want to hear this, but I'm just so excited I have never had a really good set of headphones and I actually bought them for work, but I couldn't help myself and I'm using them right now. They are the new Bose Quiet Comfort Series. 
Oh my Dang, goodness. Dang, woman. Listen, I, I had to, you know, sell a body part to get it, but they oh, are... <laughs> That escalated quickly. <laughs> they were very expensive, but I have to tell you, the noise canceling is really good. They're comfortable. I'm just, I'm in awe. Like I listened to an audiobook. Like I listened to Eric the other day in an audiobook he was reading, and it was just like, oh, Eric, are you in the room? Hello. It was just, it was wonderful. So I just thought I'd share that with you. I'm just very happy to have tried really cool headphones. You're just <laughs> trying to make me jealous you're so cruel that's okay the the guilt will set in soon enough and i'll be like maybe i need to return these (laughs) Mm -hmm. all right all right well enough jibber jabber and here's a question for you yes here's an interjection who do you think is worse at segues me or tom oh why are you hesitating (laughs) come on now (laughs) ouch okay all right enough of that let's let's talk about some games So I have to jump in right away here about my war chest story. I feel like that sounds like some really crazy thing wow. that I've done. I know, right? In like <laughs> the 1900s, ah, war. No, it's not that exciting, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> Suzanne, you had uh, spoken, to, I think it was a few weeks ago, maybe, about the game War Chest by AEG. Uh, and I know you had given a really nice description and review of it, but I hadn't played it yet. So finally, I was able to get some two-player games off my shelf, including War Chest. Yay! So yeah, so I was really excited. And before we start, I have to tell you, I think we played this three times. And when I say fully played it, um, we played it wrong the first few times. <laughs> the no. first, Well, the first time, it's like we read the rules and it just we forgot. And I'm like, oh, my friend says, wait a second, you're not supposed to have the same, more than one of the same, I don't know if they're factions or groupings or I'm not sure what they're called, but basically the symbol on the chips are all different. You can't have two of the same on the board. Well, we must yeah. have forgotten that rule. And as oh, we're playing, that's a big rule. And as I know, and I'm like, oh, I might win this one. And then Dave's like, well, actually, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Unbelievable. We were almost done and we're like, yeah, I'm thinking we should reset and try again. So we reset and try again and we're just about to, you know, we're fair way through and I'm like, oh, why do I have so few chips in my bag? Uh Uh-huh. Two of my chips were sitting in the tray and didn't even make it into the bag. So yeah, there was the next restart. I swear it must have been like end of the night or something. I don't know. Finally, we played it through to perfection. Because at this point, there was no excuse for us not to get it right. So just a quick recap in the game. I'll just really quickly. Two players. And basically, you have these chips with different types of groupings, you know, like archers or things like that. And they have abilities. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get your control, six of your control tokens out first. And you do this by trying to get all these different types of factions on the board. And that might include destroying your opponent. So you can then take over areas where they are, put your, you know, tokens out. So, or take control of the areas. That would be the best way to put it. Um, That's really it. And there are different things like recruiting, um, taking control. So attacking, moving, these are all actions you can take in the game, but you have a bag that's full of these chips. You get to draw three of those out at a time and then decide what you're going to do with them. So If you use it face down, you have different actions like recruiting. If you do it face up, if it matches something that's on the board, perhaps that moves a certain kind of character that's on the board. So these are the different actions you can take. Um, Yeah, so I won. Yay! (laughs) I feel like that's the end of the story, but it's not. Uh, We just had such a journey going there, but I instantly knew that I was going to like it. It was like Mm -hmm. a puzzle for me. Mm-hmm. And that was how my my friend felt as well. And he's like, oh, like, it's not the type of games we usually play. Let's be honest. I played a lot of Euros, like, you know, the worker placement type game. So it's out of our realm. But I still, we knew, even playing it wrong the first couple of times, like, sure. I actually think I'm going to like this game. And we really, yeah. really enjoyed it. So I'm thinking once I explain it to one of my friends at work, we might be able to squeak this out in an hour. Maybe. Oh, are you kidding me? Easily. Yeah. So I think the first game is more like rules explanation just for yeah. the other person. And then the next time we play it, I think we can definitely do it within lunch time. Frame. Absolutely. Plus, it's not just the rules explanation, but it's really understanding your it's not just the rules explanation and understanding your own uh, units. Right. You have to understand your opponent's units, too. So, right. you know, part of the appeal of the game is that you can mix and match those and change them up, which adds a ton of variety in the gameplay. 
the the potential downside, depending if your time crunch certainly could be, you have to sometimes you're going to have to learn learn those anew. They'll be different frequently for the first number of plays, and so right. that, that may slow you down. But that's not a that that's a worthwhile thing to go through. <laughs> now, have you had a chance to play it at four players yet? I have not. I saw the four player option. I'm not big on this whole. Is it that's one of the teams? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I was like, uh, okay, I haven't played it yet. I've only played it with two player. Have you played it with the teams? I think yes. you did. Yeah, you did. Yes. Yeah. So and, well, and and I quite like it. And I like the way the the board opens up a little bit. Right. You get those wings that open up for you for those extra spots, and I really like it at four as well. So I'm glad you liked it at two. Totally can get that you might not inherently lean towards the team play, but I think you should try it at least once just to see, because I think it's fabulous that way. So there. All right. Well, we'll give it, we'll give it a whirl. All righty. Well, good. Nice job. So you've heard enough of me talking. Why don't you start this time? I know I've mixed it up a little bit. How about you go with your first game? All righty. Well, I will dive on in with, I feel God, my segues are so bad. I should have come up with something more clever. Let me climb on up. See, that's better. Okay. (laughs) Walls of York. This is a game from Cranio Creations, designed by Emiliano Venturini, and the art is by Sabrina Miramon, and it retails for around $40 U.S., Wait, wait, wait. Is this the game we saw at Essen? And I was like, ooh, this looks kind of good. And you're like, ooh, this looks kind of good. But they weren't selling it. So we had to wait till we came back. And now you're talking about it. Is this the one? I think so. Okay, I'm excited. Yeah, okay. at Cridio's booth. And so I, I found it online at somebody. So so picked up a copy. And, and, and here we are. Walls of York, you're going to open it up. And it comes with... Um, a bunch of tiles, like gridded tiles, and you're going to lay out four of these tiles so you have a board in front of you. Each player sets up with uh, their own board, their own land, and then what happens is you're basically trying to wall in, hence the clever title, Walls of York. <laughs> you're trying to wall in a specific region because on these boards, there's a whole bunch of different icons printed, and ultimately you want to wall in the correct icons. The way this happens is that you roll three dice and that is the King's decree. And that determines basically how many of each icon you need to wall into the walls of York. Okay. That, yeah. All righty. <laughs> anyway. Um, and then once you know that, There is this massive, I don't know how big this die is. It's enormous. It's comically large. This big red and white wooden die has, uh, each face has two things printed on it. A series of dots, which represent coins, and then these dashed lines that are the walls. So you roll the die and what comes up, you have to place walls that match the pattern on the die. And... If you can't or you don't want to, you can always just place one wall, and that's fine. And so you're basically just, after you figure out the decree, you're rolling the die, placing the walls, figuring out your path, trying to pen in the right things. Uh, When somebody completes their their wall, so it completely encapsulates an area, then they start collecting coins while everybody else finishes up. And then when everybody finishes, you check what happened. So did you meet the requirement? Did you get at least the right number of wells and at least the right number of churches? Yes, great. Then you have to count the Viking icons because whoever had the most Vikings inside their city will basically get attacked and get a Viking token that'll hit them for negative points at the end of the game. And then you count the coins that you manage to capture inside the wall because that is actually what matters. The coins are the points. So you do this twice. It just plays in two rounds. You roll, you, you reset the decree, you re-roll the decree, and then you do the exact same thing again. You figure out who had the least amount of Vikings and you get the king's favor. And then you count up all your coins, you lose points for the Viking, you get points for the king's favor, and you see who won. What's interesting to me, and I I know people roll their eyes at me, and perhaps deservedly so, this feels like it should have been a roll and write game. 
It really does. Okay. Um, you The way you form your boards, you use four little boards to create one big board. And you can rotate them or change them. You can have where people all play with the same configuration or people play with different configurations. So it adds a nice variety in play. Um, but then you're rolling a die and you're creating these wall lines on your board. And I can just see this thing. Oh. If I just had a piece of paper in front of me with a grid, <laughs> I could just be drawing them equally as well. And that I lean towards that a little bit more because the wall pieces themselves are nice little molded plastic walls. They look like little castle walls. Interesting. The the disadvantage is, is that they are slightly taller than they are wide and they are very tipsy. It's very easy to knock these walls over, which is fiddly and slightly annoying as you're mm. doing that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, as you're, you know, the third time you knock over your walls, you're like, guys, this would be so much easier if I could just write them on a piece of paper, that kind of thing. Um, there is a, a a dice tower, I guess. For, uh, I don't know what you would call it, a dice stand that they have you assemble to out of cardboard. It's a really interesting 3D construction. It has three channels and you drop one die down each channel and then it the die rests there. And the channel actually has the icon above it so you know oh this has the church icon above it oh the die has a two so i know i need two church icons it works for what it is that piece was incredibly fiddly to assemble Mm. i cannot like it was very very frustrating for me to assemble but the good news is is once you put it together it just sits in the box fully assembled you never have to touch it again and and it it does its job fine it seems incredibly unnecessary I, I feel like the molded wall pieces felt unnecessary that way. But I think that this is something that my friend Josh, as we were playing, he mentioned that publishers are competing. It's hard to get eyes on games. It's hard. Right. So they add things. They add like this really tall 3D constructed paper tower, cardboard tower for the dice. Is it necessary? No. Is it eye catching? Sure. Right. And and maybe that's that's part of what it is. So maybe it achieved it, its goal. Um they they give you these cardboard frames. You have to assemble it every time. It's a puzzle cut, and you have to build this frame, and then you're supposed to set your four other boards in there. Assembling the frame is actually fairly fiddly. They don't fit together great. You find yourself kind of like squidging and squeezing and and jamming things together to make them work. So ultimately, for our next plays, I was just not using the frame and laying my walls just along the edge, and it worked better it worked just fine so that wasn't a big deal um you know uh, walls of york i liked the game it was fine um i would definitely play it again but it just it didn't stand out to me some of the fiddly bits were fiddly enough to be annoying uh it's very light it's very quick that's and other than the, like assembling those frames, it, it's a quick setup, that kind of thing. Uh, along with my friend's thoughts just about production value and what it takes for a publisher to get eyes on their game in today's market. Um, just in general, it's hard for games to, to, to I, I don't know, make an impression. It, it, there's so much competition out there. And ultimately for me, mm. I've played so many games Walls of York just doesn't stand out. I would play it again. I We had fun playing. It just doesn't do anything significantly different in a significantly better or different way. So <laughs> Walls of York, enjoyed it. Good game. I think I would like it better as a roll and write game. And, and we'll happily play it anytime. But um, probably this one, I, 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 it's probably going to, not hang around much longer. Okay, that's good to know because it's one that I remember seeing. I'm pretty sure that's the one we saw at Essen and I was like, oh, it looks interesting. And it's funny, it didn't look light when I was looking at it. It looked like it might have had a bit of crunch to it. But now that you're saying that, I'm like, okay, which is fine. I don't mind a lighter game, but there are a few things you're talking about that make me kind of feel, is it worth it? So, I mean, I won't know until I give it a try, but good to know. And I also was also thinking of Game of Thrones the entire time you were thinking you were talking about it because you started talking about kings and walls and well, I don't know. Game of Thrones is happening in an hour. So it's like on the brain. So rather appropriate. (laughs) There you go. 
So I'm going to jump in next to Targi. And Woo! this, oh, uh, yeah, it was something. It was something. Wait, what? <laughs> Amanda Ann. <laughs> I'm going to. Yeah. Don't make me. Look, we've disagreed on games before and I've kind of just let it go. Oh, oh. <laughs> but if you trod upon my beloved Targi, we're going to have. We're going to have words, woman. <laughs> well, I just, I'm going to just leave it at it was something. We'll just, we'll leave it there. Oh my gosh. We'll All leave right. It there. I'm going to zip my lip. Just, yeah. We'll, I'm we'll, very tense right now. Yeah. Though. Let me, let me get, the, let me get it all out and then we'll have a discussion. Mm-hmm. All right. So Targi is designed by Andrea Steiger. The artist is Tyra Akitsu and Franz Vowinkel. And the publisher is Cosmos. This retails for about $18 Canadian and $15 US. And for those who have not listened to the show before, these prices are taken from online. The Canadian prices are from Board Game Bliss and the, American prices I'm currently taking from Cool Stuff Inc. So just to give you an approximation, that's all that is. And it is a two player game plays in about 60 minutes. And we're looking at some set collection and worker placement. So in the game, what basically you're trying to do is you're trying to win by getting the most points. Ah, like any other game. And how do you do that? Well, you're building your own tableau, which is going to generate points on cards that you have, in addition to some end game scoring that it might ensue, as well as points you may gain throughout the game. So it's different because this game has cards. So cards, and then you have your your, your little people. I don't I don't remember, Suzanne. Are they called Targi, the, the, the people that you use in the game? The, the meeples? Uh, I think so. I think yeah. so. Yeah, so that's what you're going to use. And then you have these other kind of, I think they're called tribe markers. I could be incorrect See, about that. I've actually replaced my meeples with with Totoro meeples. <laughs> <laughs> it was okay. So I had to think about it. I was looking like, at your face like, Totoros. you've definitely no, had this game longer than I've had. So. But uh, yeah, then you have these are tribe markers, but they're just kind of small markers that you'll use in the game as well. So what happens is when you set up the board, it's a five by five grid and there's a border around it. And you'll know because these cards kind of have a, well, a border around them. So you know that these ones go around the border. And in the four kind of edges, there are raids. So in the four corners of this box are, uh, that you're making, there are raids. And we'll talk about those because those are things you're going to have to to pay once the robber. Oh, it's a little gray meeple that goes around, tracks the game, so to speak. When it gets to one of those squares, you're going to have to pay out. But we'll talk about that in a moment. So you set up the border and then you're going to set up inside of the border the rest of the squares using cards that are marked tribe cards and there are good cards the tribe cards generally are cards that you're going to want to take to put in your own tableau and you want to build up your own tableau because that's how you're going to do some set collection and these cards will have uh, certain characters or things depicted on them and when you place them in your tableau having four of the same in a row is going to give you i think four points having one of each symbol in a row gives you two points. So that's where you can get some set collection happening. So these are things that will also give you abilities that you can use immediately or throughout the game when you acquire them. And they do have a cost. And the goods, I think, are either salt, pepper, figs or something to that effect, but and money. So things you can use to buy these cards. Then you have goods cards, which give you the goods that I was just talking about. <laughs> so uh, when you play the game, so once that grid's all set up, the little gray robber starts at the, the first tile and uh, basically nobody can place at that specific tile, which is unfortunate, but there is a card, that ability that will allow someone to do that. That may come up later. So the players take turns placing on the outer ridge of the board, and you'll see you don't get anything right away. That's going to get resolved after. Here's a tricky thing, and this came up a few times. You cannot place across, directly across from your competitor. I was like, right. what is happening here? It was so mm-hmm. tricky. Happened so many times where I got blocked. So mm-hmm. that was like, and I kept forgetting. And my friend's like, uh, you know, Mandy, you, uh, you can't put that there. I'm like, what? And it happened more than once. Like, this is crazy. So it made it a little frustrating for me. Uh, so once you've each put out uh, your, you know, your target on the areas you'd like to place them, you kind of do this intersecting thing. So I don't know how you would explain that, Suzanne, but it's like your X and Y points. <laughs> yeah, if it, that that is hard. If you were to draw a straight line across and down, where would they meet? Right, where they intersect is where you're going to put those. Remember those tribe right. markers? That's where mm-hmm. you're going to put them. And you've got two of them. So it may happen where you've placed your target that you don't get two intersections. You may only get one. And basically that card is one that you're going to either action or keep. In addition to the cards that your target are in front of on the periphery of the of the gaming area. And you take turns 
actioning all of those. So that was really fun. I had a really good time using the card called Caravan, which literally just said, flip the top card of the goods pile and you get those goods. Use that one quite a bit, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, it's great. Uh, when cards come out of the tableau, so if a tribe card comes out of the tableau, it is replaced with a face down goods card and vice versa. Uh, and then when we start the new round, those flip over and we do it all over again. So the game ends once the robber has kind of gone all the way around back to the so to that last square around the board. Um, or if somebody has 12 cards, I guess they end up being the tribe cards in their display or tableau, and that will trigger the end of the game. Throughout the game, there are some cards. They're not bad necessarily, but you got to pay up. And those are those raid cards I was telling you about when the robber hits one of those cards. Well, the first one's not too bad. I think you have to give up a good. When you get to the next one, it's giving up two goods. When you get to the next one, it's giving up three goods. And that can where it's told if you're trying to, you know, pay for cards in the game. I think I covered it all. Did I miss anything? No, I mean, that's, that's, that's the general thorough. gist of yeah. it. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And then when you go to scoring at the end, basically you're scoring the cards themselves have points on them. They have some end game things that might happen. Um, you also have points that you may have acquired throughout the game. And then your set collection, so the different uh, things you got in your row or the same will give you points. Ah, yeah. So, man, Targi was was something. It was something fantastic. It was so Oh, my good. gosh. <laughs> I had Ooh. you going, didn't I? Had you going. <laughs> I, I was trying to think of ways I could <laughs> gain. Oh, whoa. I'm was, so relieved and happy. It was. No, you don't understand. It was so good. And I feel bad that I had yes. never played this game before because technically I was going to save this for a shelf staple because it's what, 2012 or 11? It's somewhere yeah, around yeah, yeah. there. Sure. But it I couldn't definitely wait. definitely qualify. We both, my it's friend and I right. both. It's just, just that good. It was so good. Like I, it was had like those tense moments and those frustrating moments where like, oh, I can't go here because I'm across this person. I'm like, well, I'll go here. Oh, wait, no, I can't do that either. So it was just whole that whole reworking of what you had to do on the spot. And I'm like that type of player. So for me, it was just played right into that for me. And it was such a close game. I think our score ended up being like 30 to 35. Like it was so close, but we yeah. both felt like we were doing different things to get we were where we were trying to go. And it was still working. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, mine worked a little better because I won. <laughs> but I liked the fact that you can do different things and still have an imp- have an impactful game. Uh, I definitely really push the caravan. And I think it's called Targi Expansion or something. There's another card that goes just above that. And it allows you to take a tribe card off the top of the pile. And you're able to, if you're able to pay for it, you can put it into your display, which then kind of pushes the game to end faster because you're getting more cards in your display. Mm-hmm. so I'm like oh I like that because I was really behind for a while and then the set collection threw me off because I'm like you have to decide do I need to put four cards out of the same sh- symbol I might not get that maybe I need to do one of each like it's just I love all the decisions I like the tension it's mean but not intentionally mean because you're just trying to get your stuff it's not your fault that it happens to be across from where somebody else might want to go just saying I don't know. I I just, I loved it. And for a card game, like it's just cards, cards, a few pieces of wood. And it still was a thinky game and Mm -hmm. impactful. That's the word I want to use. I just, I can see why everybody loves it. I love the fact that it's two player because you get that back and forth vibe. I I just, I can't say enough of how much I enjoyed Targi. Oh, excellent. You, (laughs) You are a wise woman. You have excellent taste and... I admire everything about you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> hmm. yeah, no, I, uh, now you're just making me think of Targi and it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's just so good. And it's a great example of just how I think player count limitation can be such a fabulous tool in a game designer's tool belt to create a tight, finely honed game experience. And Targi is just exactly. A prime example of that. Oh, I'm so glad. Now I want to play Targi. I can't believe. I, I just I'm, I think I, I want to play Targi with you now. That I, I will okay. put it in the bag. Noted. Alrighty. Well, switching gears to something a little lighter. And apparently I just, Walls of York made me want a roll and write. So let's talk about an actual roll and write. Shocking. I know. <laughs> there is... A publisher that I have followed for literally, I don't know, decades at this point. And I've tried to release most of my 
hardcore collection tendencies because I definitely have those tendencies. But one publisher where I just feel compelled to own all their games is Days of Wonder. Okay. And then Days of Wonder goes and says they're going to make a Roland Wright game. And I about lost my noodle. I just <laughs> flipped out and was hungry, 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 hungry for it. Of course. I was so hungry that knowing it was going to come relatively soon, I could not wait for it to hit the States. And I ordered it from France. Oh, my goodness. So I could play it a couple of months earlier than I could get it. That's it. It, 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 it was a decision. It was a choice. <laughs> so Corinth... As said, it is a roll and write game designed by Sebastien Pochon. The art is from Julio Caesar and Cyril Dujan, publishers Days of Wonder. And I paid 15 euro for it, okay. which so that'll put it in the $20 range uh, in the US. And, you know, that's typically where roll and writes are hitting. They're hitting between like that $20 and $30 price point. So, you know. Now, what people may or may not know is Corinth is really a roll and write application of an older game called Yispahan. Yispahan. Okay. Y-S-P-A-H-A-N by Sebastian Pochon. So basically they took this game and realized that there were elements of it that they could, I don't know if you want to use the word streamline or alter or however, and make it into a roll and write game. So Corinth is really Yispahan, the roll and write game. Mm. And what this is, is every player is going to get their own sheet. There's one like little shared stripey board that has the uh, markets on them and a bunch of dice. You are going to roll the dice and then put them on this action board or market board. Whatever the highest value is, those will go on the top where the gold is. And then you work your way from the bottom with the rest of the dice. So the lowest value goes in the low row, then the next higher, and the next higher, and the next higher. What that means is that there's often market stripes that aren't activated the way that they have you lay out the dice. At first, you may be like, whoa, what's going on there? And actually, once you get into it, you're like, oh, that's quite clever. Great. Mm -hmm. Roll the dice, allocate them. Uh, you can, if you're the active player, you can pay to add some extra dice into the mix for that round and that only you can use, which is quite handy. Um, and then you are going to, I guess, draft, for lack of a better term, the dice. So you have a couple of choices here. You're going to take all the dice. So let's say you rolled three threes. You're going to take all those threes off the board and you've claimed the threes. And then whatever action or market they aligned with, you're going to take that action. So maybe the three is aligned with the green market. So you'll mark off a certain, if you pulled three dice off, you'll mark off three of those market spots. Well, what if three happened to be the lowest value that you rolled? Then it's on the bottom with the goats. And then you would get goats. Wait, oh, okay. I thought you said ghosts, but you said goats. Like, ah, goats. Nah. Okay. okay. Nah. Just check it. <laughs> exactly. Um, then you would count up some goats for that. And that's fairly standard roll, right? So basically you're filling the market spots and then the first person to complete the market spots can get a bonus. And then when you complete whole sections, you'll get points at the end of the game for filling those in. Goats give you some flexibility in the future um, that we can talk about. Uh -huh. Or you can take the die... And the dice. So if I took the threes and instead you can mark off three spaces, you can use your steward on this other section of the board that has like paths on it that has like a little not map or grid, I guess. And you can move your little steward around to these different spots to try to collect bonuses and points through that movement. So dice are rolled. You're going to draft dice. You're either going to use them primarily to mark off market stalls or move your steward around to get bonuses and points and things like that you play a certain number of rounds and then high score wins and that's the whole game it is very light it's very straightforward to play um there are some extra things there's some buildings you can buy with gold and goats and those buildings can give you points or bonuses things like that um but not not a lot else not a ton of complexity 
But, you know, Mandy, sometimes for whatever reason, even if you can't super quantify it, a game just clicks. Yep. A game just works. Absolutely. And for me, Corinth just works. It's not the most complex thing in the world. It's also not the most simplistic thing in the world. It 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 finds a nice line of throw it on the table, play a quick game. You're still working your brain. You still feel like you're making interesting choices. You are dealing with the randomness of the dice, as you often do in a roll and write game. And you have fun and you feel satisfied at the end of the game. Now, is it blow your socks off? I've played roll and write games like uh, Metro X just blew my mind as uh-huh. I played it or welcome to things like that. I will say Corinth doesn't blow my mind, but I will say I absolutely love my plays of it. It's just delightful The the, the, that little board layout with how those dice get allocated. The first time you play, you very quickly realize, Oh, that's interesting. It's very random, but it's interesting. <laughs> um, so yeah, Corinth is just, a delightful roll and write game. I really like it. I know that some people have complained that the camels in Ispahan have been removed and now we get goats in Corinth, which to some people is a downgrade in mammals, but I think goats are lovely. So I have no complaints there. Okay, girl, that's, that's good to know. I do have a question. I've seen it online. Is the box large? It looks big. Oh, right. Yeah. If you take a photo of the box without context and knowing days of wonder, you're going to expect it to be that pretty standard. Like literally some right. people call it the ticket to ride size box or right. right. Or the days of, like they've they're they're It's like Xerox for photocopiers, <laughs> right? The yes. ticket to ride size box. No, Corinth is in a much smaller box. Great okay. question. It's probably like eight by eight inches. OK, that's not bad. Cover. So, yeah, it's in a small, thin, portable box. Okay, good to know. One that is also on my list, so I'll just have to take a sneak peek at your copy. I del- oh. I'm happy to share. <laughs> so well, now we're going from Corinth into the Star Realm Frontier. So let's talk about terrible segues. That one just yeah. you know, crashed and burned into we're the Milky terrible. Way. So. <laughs> well, it's fine. It'll, it'll, it'll be good, good, good fodder. All right. Just don't say anything. Nobody will ever notice. That's right. Wink, wink. Okay, so this is designed by Robert Doherty and Darwin Castle. There's no artist that's been listed, and the publisher is White Wizard Games. So it retails for about $18 Canadian, $15 US. It's considered a deck builder, cooperative, take that. And the player count, well, it's going to vary in this one. So you can go anywhere from solo up to, I think it's six or seven players, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, this one's quite different than the original. So the gameplay for Star Realms Frontiers, for the most part, the base is the same as the original Star Realms. For those of you who don't know, it is literally one of the deck builders. Like this is the one everybody knows because everybody plays the app. Thank you, Suzanne, for getting me addicted to that. You're <laughs> and welcome. everyone else. You're welcome. <laughs> Oh yeah, and um, in this in in Star Realms, basically, uh, you're it's like a trading card game, but it's kind of mixing that in with you know the deck building, and you are attacking. You are attacking your competitor with using ships, bases, um, and you're also able to acquire money from these cards where you can buy from a trade row to kind of strengthen your hand. So like a deck builder, then these cards will also allow you to trash cards, you know, to make that deck nice and formidable for your opponent, if you will. Um, I really enjoy the uh, the bases that can go up because they can kind of help protect you. They have some bases that protect. I think they're called outposts. And then they have ones that don't protect you. So they can come and straight attack you versus having to attack your bases first. Uh, there's different types of factions. And I find the different types of ones you choose will depend on kind of the type of attack or play you want to have. I'm a big fan of the blobs, the blob faction. I don't know. They seem a little more cutthroat. Well, not the most cutthroat, but I like the way they work. So (laughs) it's one of my favorites. For those of you who've never seen it, it's the ones with the little green kind of circle on them. So those ones are fun. So basically you play those until someone loses all their authority. So authority is basically like your health. And uh, once that's been decimated to zero, you lose, the other person wins. (laughs) And that's the general gist of the game. 
Now, in Frontiers, a lot of that is the same, but they have a variety of ways that you can play. So the way we played last night was uh, cooperatively with two players, and we played against the one of the automaton bosses. Uh, so if those of you are familiar with Hero Realms, it kind of had that feel with the kind of boss. So basically, we're doing the same kind of playthrough. Uh, where you draw five cards in your hand and then you play them out and it may have some damage that you're giving the boss in this case or you're, you know, and you're buying some cards and then it move to the next player and then the boss gets to go. Now, the boss has a whole bunch of things on their card. So they have these cards where it lists all the things that they can do, but we have to run through certain steps. So, for example, the first thing is the boss is going to look at attacking outposts. And specifically the ones, you know, that are prote- like the, that uh, will protect a player and the ones that are not protecting the player. Then they're going to look at attacking. So there's a few steps. And then if it has multiple cards that it needs to action, it goes through them all over again. So you can be destroyed rather quickly, depending on the strength and what level you're playing at. We ended up playing on easy, which I think was a bit of a mistake because we actually end up taking three turns each before the boss hits. And then it takes a turn for the first start of that round and I found mm-hmm. that was maybe a little bit too much for us we probably mm-hmm. could have swung down to veteran but we were scared so we were like, <laughs> let's just let's just try it on easy first um so and I had not played a cooperative like that before for star realm so we enjoyed it but I definitely think we should have amped up the the difficulty level I had also played uh, a different version so not with the bosses uh, I think we played the hunter and it's with three players that we had played it and basically you're trying to get the last person out sort of thing you know literally hunting the other (laughs) players but the base gameplay is the same so it's just on who you attack is different so because it's three players right so Mm -hmm. that's where it Mm -hmm. changes a bit so they have different they have a variety of different ones in there i think they have another one called free for all they have one called hydra you know and obviously being player versus player just in a different way they also have something new called the double ally ability so if you're familiar with the ally abilities remember i talked about the whole blob faction so Mm -hmm. having one in play and then pulling out another card that has that same symbol on it is going to activate something else on that card that may have that kind of blob symbol. Ooh, I get this too. Now they have the double ally ability. So you can have the single and then underneath that there's a double. So it has two of that symbol, meaning you have to have another card in play Two, So instead of just having the one, you need another one with that faction and it will also trigger that ability, which is fantastic. So it's like more damage. Hello. Or more money, depending on which one you go with. So, or health for that matter. So, Overall, uh, this one is different in the fact that it gives you a variety of ways to play. And I like the fact that you can choose to do it cooperatively, player versus player, but you can also now incorporate groups, not just two players playing. So I'm a big fan of Star Realms. So for me, this was obviously had to go in the shelf. I have the humongous box (laughs) with all the Star Realms stuff. So yeah, I'm a fan. And I'm not even, I don't even really care for deck builders that much because this is like a straight up deck builder. It doesn't have anything else with it. Just deck builder. And Mm -hmm. I love it. It's just so much fun. It's a quick play. And I think that's what it is. It doesn't overstay its welcome. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really enjoy that. And I just have a lot of fun. And I still play the physical one. Even though I have the app, I still play the physical game. I love this. Makes it more versatile now with the variety of ways that you can play it. I did find the card at first. It took us a bit of, um, when we were doing the automaton boss, there were a few things that the wording could have been a bit clearer. Like when it talks about a boss using on certain cards, only using the uh, ally ability. So we're like, so it doesn't use the primary ability. I mean, I guess it goes without saying, cause I didn't say it, but we weren't sure. And there was no clarification and that could make a difference in the game. So mm-hmm. the stuff like that just, I think needed to be a little clearer. But other than that, I thought the cards that they made were quite large, gave you the information for the most part that you needed. And we had a really good time with it. And I liked the variety of the different levels that you can play it at. So overall for me, we really enjoyed it. I love Star Realms. Star Realms Frontiers is basically just an add-on of more things, but it is a standalone. So still great. Love it, love it, love it. Have you played this one? I have. I Not as much as I think you have, <laughs> but um, uh, from from a, a Frontiers-specific point of view. Mm-hmm. Uh, and right there with you, sister. Star Realms is evergreen for me. I just, I just love it. I like Hero Realms a lot, too. Um, And I actually like that one of the things they're doing, and I think Frontiers does some of this, right? You mentioned it earlier, is I like that. I think that they learned from Star Realms when they developed Hero Realms. Right. And they did some really great things with Hero Realms. 
and now I think they're bringing some of the great stuff they did with Hero Realms back to Star Realms. So it 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 becomes much more of a almost thematic setting um, preference right. situation because you really are ending up with options in both games, and it's just whichever one you prefer. Um, and I really like that they're doing that and that they're you know continuing to support both both the fantasy setting and the the sci fi setting and. Yeah, Star Realms. It's a good one. Good. Hey, feel free to challenge me on the digital game, y'all. I'm at like 3,000 <laughs> games and counting, so. <laughs> and yes, I know. It's space-themed. You don't even have to say it. Don't at me. I know. <laughs> well, I just feel like everybody out there should. We have our little secret accountability club for Mandy, right? <laughs> so, space <laughs> She doesn't really like space. Okay. And, and you know, she doesn't really like deck builders either. So we're <laughs> okay. going to have to keep an eye on that one too. Who, who doesn't like Star Realms? Come on. Come it's on. Fair. Fair point. Fair. In the two player game, Revolution of 1828, you are trying to become the next president of the United States. To reach this goal, each player tries to take the election tiles that suit you best and hinder your opponent's campaign. If you're a fan of Feld, oh yeah, this girl right here. And well, if you like some talk of elections, don't forget to check out Revolution of 1828 from Renegade Games and look for it at your local game store or online today. Alrighty, I am going to wrap up my games this time with Small Islands. Small Islands is designed by Alexis Allard. Uh, art is from Orly Guarino, and it's published by Mushroom Games, which is a publisher out of Asia. So this oh, is one nice. of my treasures that I get. Um, I picked this one up at Essen, and uh, I I know. Uh, talking to the publisher just the other day that they are working on getting distribution beyond. So hopefully this will be easier for people to get in the near future if it catches their interest. Small Islands is a tile lane game and it's going to look familiar to other tile lane games where you have tiles that have water or land on them and in different configurations. And you're going to be putting them out and very, very typical ways. Water has to align to water. Land has to align to land. You know, all the illustrations have to kind of line up and then that's a legal placement. One of the charming things about this game, the rule book specifically says you're not allowed to place tiles over the edge of the table because the world is flat and the edge of the table represents the edge of the world. Oh, wow. Well, that's <laughs> And that just made me laugh. I just <laughs> love that line in the rule book. It was very funny. Oh, my goodness. Um, but it it does actually matter because if, if you play this on a smaller table, you're going to have a different experience than if you play it on a larger table. Because what, what you're doing is you're playing to a communal board or a communal tableau and you're creating your own little archipelago, uh, you know, this whole, whole little world of little islands. You're going to, at the beginning of the game, you're going to be dealt some little goal cards and you're going to pick one for this round and then you're going to pick one to save for next round. And then one gets the third one gets discarded. And then you get a little hand, you get two tiles in your hand, and then there's some laid out, and then you just start playing tiles. Okay, on my turn, I'm going to draw a tile and play a tile. So I'll draw a tile, so I have three in my hand, and then of those three, I can play one legally on the board. What you're trying to do is the, the tiles have icons on them. The land has icons. So they have um, dragon fruit or some green leafy thing that I don't know what it is or a lotus flower um, or anchors. And the goal cards have things that align to that. Hey, you want to, you're going to score points if the island has more lotus flowers than dragon fruit. And then you're going to score one point for every lotus. Great. So you're thinking, okay, I'm going to create an island that has a lot of lotus flowers and not a lot of dragon fruit. You go through this, you go through a minimum number of tiles and then the round can end when a player chooses to end it because there's a boat that you can place out. And we'll talk about that in a second. So at the end of the round, all the tiles are out and then players may place one of their little buildings onto the islands. Now you have four buildings to play with each round. You have four buildings to play with. So you place as many buildings as legally possible. 
So you could score multiple islands in a round. So it's not just about, it's called small islands for a reason. You want to like, if in that scenario, just maybe you want to create lots of little islands so that you can place multiple of your buildings out and around. Or there are scenarios where maybe you, you do kind of want to build a large, like it's more efficient to build a larger island with lots of a single icon on it and, and score that one. But one of the tricks in this game is you can score each island only once in the game. So once I've placed my little house on this island, I can never place another house on it, even if it's super juicy. So you kind of have to plan ahead on how you're building these islands. And that's where the cleverness of being able to save a goal card for the next round comes in. Because not only are you building for this round, but you realize you're thinking ahead to what you can build the next round. And in the next round, you get two new goal cards and you can actually change up your plan, which is another thing I really, really like. I like that. Okay. I was working for a lot of lotuses. Oh, crud. It didn't come together. Oh, well, here's two new cards. Okay. I'm going to switch gears. Now I want a lot of temples. I really like that flexibility where you have the ability to plan it forward, but if it falls apart, you also get an opportunity to adjust. I think that that's very, very clever. Now, you're going to go through a certain number of minimum tiles to kind of see the stack. And then after that has been played out on a player's turn there, every player has a boat and you can instead choose to take your boat and place it out on the board. And then that ends around. And then you do the scoring, as I mentioned. And at the end of the game, um, the boat will score hmm. points for the number of anchors on tiles that surround it. So it's just a little extra way to get points. It's a very straightforward from a rules point of view, it's very, very straightforward. It's very easy to learn. It's very easy and quick to play. It's it For anybody who's played games like this before, it's going to feel very intuitive. I think the cleverness really comes in in those goal cards and kind of playing with your natural instincts to build big. It's Again, it's called small islands for a reason. And where you're really going to maximize your score is by creating multiple scoring opportunities in a single round for yourself. If you're only scoring one house in a round every round, mm. you're not actually doing that great, likely. So thinking in that dimension, planning ahead, really hosing your your opponent. The other oh. thing that you, <laughs> Oh, my God. Um, in fact, in the last play I had of this... My friend, and I'm doing air quotes with the word friend, my (laughs) friend, Josh, I was working this. I had such a good plan. I was working it so hard. I had my little islands. They were all developed. I had, it was going to be great. And then (laughs) Josh connected the two separate islands and I had already scored one. And by connecting my unconnected island with one I had already scored a house on, because you can only put one house on every island. I couldn't score the thing I'd been working on the entire round. Oh, no. He, with one tile, he completely hosed me. See? Let's just say we had words. (laughs) Friendly words. Sure. We'll go with that. But to be fair, I could have seen that coming. I should have thought ahead. I could have closed it off earlier. I was getting greedy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and that's the game. And and that's what I really like about it. So Small Islands for me, it, it's a very nice tile lane game. It has just enough different in it to make it stand out. Like we were talking about, Wall Street Work just doesn't stand out in my head. Small Islands stands out for me. It just has enough little twists to make it delightful. The other thing I will just mention is that there's a lot of tiles in the game, tile lane. There is like random little art bits through on all the, like just different art everywhere. So maybe this tile has a little school of dolphins swimming around, or this tile has an a kraken, literally like a big kraken coming out of the ocean. There is a tile, and I actually took a photo of this and shared it on my social media because I was like, oh my gosh. And I played this game probably five times now. I'd never seen this one before, but I was playing with my friend just this last game. There's a, a Millennium Falcon. That's awesome. Like a little teeny tiny Millennium uh, Falcon landed on this beach. Now, I won't talk about the licensing rights here, but from a yeah. from a player point of view, it was absolutely delightful to find that little art Easter egg. So Small Islands is a simple rules tile lane game that has just enough 
clever twists in it to make it stand out and extra enjoyable for me. So it's a real winner. And I, I definitely hope Small Islands gets picked up um, so that more people can enjoy it. Well, there are some wonderful things that grow on Small Islands, like flowers, perhaps. But that's not the name of the game I'm going to talk about next. It's called Seikatsu. <laughs> <laughs> but it has flowers in it. Yes. Yes. That's close enough. And birds. So close. Oh, almost there. Very close. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. And the Saikatsu is designed by Matt Loomis and Isaac Shalev. Artist is Peter Woken and published by IDW Games. This range is about uh, $35 Canadian. I couldn't pinpoint a price online for uh, the US, but I believe it is about the same price. Uh, it plays one to four players in about 15 to 30 minutes. And we're looking at a game that looks at pattern building, set collection, and some tile placement. So in Se uh, Seikatsu... Again, another game where you want to get all the points to win. Uh, but basically, strategic placing is going to help you here because scoring happens in a couple of ways. So let me tell you a little bit about how the game is kind of set up and plays. So ideally, this game, looking at it, you think it plays, and we'll get into what I think about this, three players. And you kind of go, how do you know that? The way the board is set up, it's kind of split into to three colors. And this is because you're going to need to see a certain perspective. So you're going to have to view the board from where you're sitting. So if you're the green player, the green player has a certain way of looking at the board. And if you're pink on the other side of the board, it looks at the board at a different angle. And then I think the other color is blue and it looks at the board through a different angle. And in the middle, there is like a little kind of pond circle and then around it, some circles where you're going to be placing your tiles. It's hard to picture, but it kind of gives you an idea. So there's a nice bag full of these tiles. They are really nice and heavy feeling. And each player, I believe you end up getting, is it two tiles? I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I think so. Do you remember off the top of your head? I think it's two tiles. I don't. It's been a while since I've played. I know. It's like I played it the other day, but in my brain, there's just so many games in there. So you get tiles in your hand, and then from the tiles in your hand, you have to place one on the board. Now, there's already a few that have been placed on the board, and you have to place beside one that's already there. So on the tiles, there'll be different types of birds, and then there'll be a ring of flowers around each bird. Okay? <sighs> okay, so this is where it gets a bit confusing. <laughs> During the game, you're trying to score matching birds. You're ignoring the flowers, sort of. They are going to matter at the end of the game, but they do not currently matter for scoring. So when you place a tile, so if there's a blue bird on the board, you may want to place your blue bird tile that you have in your hand, place it beside another blue bird that's existing on the board. And then you get points. So you'd get two points for that if it was beside one other bird. Okay, and they have to be beside each other. Now, you may decide later on, maybe there's a blue bird that doesn't, uh, there's a bird you want to place it next to, and it's not going to score any points, and why would you want to do that? Well, getting to the end of the game, that might benefit you because of the type of flowers that's around it. You may also draw tiles that have um, koi fish on them, and koi fish are acting as like a wild when you place them. So it can become any bird for you to score, but then that's it. Somebody else can't decide to place beside it later and say, oh, it's this. No, once you've placed it, that wild kind of is gone for that, for that moment. So you play out all your tiles in the game. So until everybody's placed out all their tiles and then scoring at the end happens. Now, this is where your perspective matters. And this is where the flowers matter. So let's say I'm the player who was playing green. I kind of have to look for my side of the board, looking across at the rows from where I'm sitting. And this is how I'm going to score. And you want to score points based on tiles that are beside each other from your perspective in their corresponding rows with the same types of flowers. So if you have lots of flowers that are white in your row, the same type. So if, for example, you had four, that's going to get you more points. Off the top of my head, I think it's like 10 points or something to that effect. So the more you have in a row, I think you can get up to six, if I'm not mistaken, around there, depending on the row you're looking at, um, which can get you, I think the highest you can get is like 21 points in a row. So that's really good. Uh, those little koi fish that I said didn't matter after you'd place them. Well, they come up again now and you can make them any flower you want if they appear in one of your rows. So basically you go through, I don't know, it's six or seven different rows, but you go through all the different rows and you score them from your perspective to get your points. And that's literally the game. So it's hard to explain, but I think I give you a general sense of it. Mm -hmm. I like this game at three, the way that it sure. looks like it's sure. designed to be played. Mm -hmm. You can play it with four, which is a variant, and that's where it's kind of like a team effort, and it kind of brings me back to 
the other game that we were talking about in teams, the uh, war chest, right? So it's that sort mm-hmm. of thing where you can play with teams and I've seen it played with teams and it's fine. I just like my own area to kind of work with <laughs> <laughs> in this type of game. And then it also plays solo. So if anyone's interested in solo version, it does play that as well. The pieces for this game are excellent. The, the tiles with the, with the, with the birds and the flowers, very nice quality tiles. I thought that was well done. Mm-hmm. I did have a bit of an issue with the, the the pictures of the flowers specifically. Some of them are hard to see because they have some that are like a, a light pink and then some that are like a lilac kind of color and they're very mm-hmm. close. So even me, I'm like, oh, I'm having a really hard time discerning which is which. So I think they could have used a bit more contrast with that to make it a bit easier to discern the different types of flowers. But that's mm-hmm. a minor thing for me to pick on but it is important if you're trying to you know if you can't see it or you can't tell the differences because hello it matters where you place these things at the end of the game for flower scoring uh it's a simple enough game because i taught it uh, at a convention and um I'm trying to think there was like some young children I had taught it to, but they picked it up. Like they understood it and I was able to sit with them and they were like, Oh, they enjoyed it. It was fast enough that they weren't bored and it wasn't Mm -hmm. too complicated, but then parents and adults and other people can still play it. And we're still finding it interesting. Mm -hmm. And for me, I thought that was cool. And I really liked that whole perspective. Like you could be helping someone out. It happened to me so many times. I'm like, wait a second. I just placed that there. That doesn't help me at all. It's now, you know, it's getting me points now with the birds, but it is helping someone get like 21 points at the end of the game. So I like the fact that there were multiple things that you had to consider when placing. So mm-hmm. overall, I, I really enjoy this game. It's been on my shelf for a while and I've definitely tried to pull it out when I can to introduce it to people who have never played it. Um, and it's always gotten a really good response. So that's uh, say Katsu. Nice. Have you played this one? I have. Um, yes. It's been a while, and I think uh, what you're saying resonates in terms of uh, you, you have to pay attention to a lot of things as you're you're choosing what to play and that directional thing, and that it is really definitely a um, optimal three player game. So, and and it sure is beautiful. Let your fingers do the walking in. Tap that app. All right, so we're going to roll into an app, Tides of Time. I know the game well. <laughs> and this is by Portal Games, designed by Christian Kula. And there are a few artists here, so obviously we want to name them all. So here we go. Tomas Jezuszek, Chris Otrowski, Dan Pello, Blake Brodinger, Artur Sadlos, and Rafael Sisma. So, so there we good. go. Oh, I so hope good so. With those names. I, I tried Nicely my best. done. So there you go. So w- w- tell us a little bit more, Suzanne. What else do we need to know about this app? Oh, sure. So um, for Portal Digital releases, Portal Games is branding their own digital stuff now, which I think is super cool. And yeah. you can find it on iOS and Android. So I think you have it on Android, right, Mandy? I do. I have it on Android. Yeah. Okay. And great. And I have it on iOS. And I noticed the price seems to be slightly different on the two platforms. So oh, they're both around $5 US, but in that zone. We'll just say in that $5 sure, zone. That works. For those of you who aren't familiar with Tides of Time, this is a two-player drafting game. I sense a theme today with two players. Exactly. It's almost like we (laughs) named our episode after I know, right? (laughs) Mm. Uh, Two-player drafting is really an unusual concept, I think, overall in games because... A lot of drafting depends on the the passing. If you're just going back and forth, how do you Mm. make that interesting? Um, And so for Tides of Time, it's a drafting game. It goes three rounds. There is a thing where you, at the end of the round, you get to save one card for future rounds, and then you discard one completely out of the game and then add some new cards in, which I think is very, very clever. So it's very, very quick, and it's basically about set collection because each of these cards will have, most of the cards, will have an icon on it, and then a way that that card scores scores points so maybe the card has a leaf icon on it but the way it scores points is it gives you points for every crown icon you have so Mm -hmm. you take the card and you put in your tableau you've got a leaf icon and now if you get crowns you'll score points with it. It, it it's an interesting it was an interesting setup when i saw it come out oh a while ago now Mm -hmm. in in real life and i've played this a lot In real life, it was just so quick and easy to play. uh, And that kind of unique two-player drafting concept is is really cool. So now we have a digital version of it. Huzzah! 
And uh, overall, I think it plays very, very well. There is a tutorial. So it will teach you the game and the interface. It's not super complicated. There are some idiosyncrasies to it, though. Um, but there's no rules in the app, which is kind of a bummer. And I, I hope that they update and add those just right. so you can reference them. And right now there's no online play. So you can play pass and play in person, which I think works very well. Or you can just play against the three different levels of AI, which have some distinct difficulty ramps mm-hmm. between them. But Everybody feels differently about AI. A lot of times an AI beats me. I see people online talking about how easy the AI is. So I wish. <laughs> your mileage may vary from AI, but there are three different levels of AI, and I've played all three of them, and um, definitely a noticeable difference, I think, between the, the, the difficulty of them. So now, Mandy, uh, you've played this in Android, so... Yeah, so I have no idea what the iOS one looks like. So I personally didn't have as much issue in this particular game not having the rules because I went through the tutorial and I found it was easy enough for me to capture. I can read the cards. However, it's nice to have the rules for clarification, but it wasn't a sticking point. You know how some games it's like, okay, no, I really need the rules to kind of read through it and understand it. I like that I could jump right in. But to be fair, I've also played this game um, outside of the app. Mm-hmm. So if someone needs rules to read, yeah, that definitely is something to to look for. So in the app, I like the whole, I don't even know how to explain this. When you, you play a card and it, it it just goes, it kind of builds that building in your mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. your atmosphere area that you have. So you play the card and it has, you know, lights it all up and kind of throws it into the field. And then pew, there's a building there that kind of matches what the card has. And then it shows like a stream of color. So I guess whatever color yep. the faction is or whatever the symbol was in the card and links it to, you know, the building that it's kind of getting the points from. So yep. I thought that was nice. I like that kind of visual feed when I'm playing a game. I'm like, oh yeah, this is connected. This is getting me points. I liked that. I wish the game had a bit more though in the art sense of it. I don't know how to explain that. Mm. The streamy coloring things were nice. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I didn't really get a nice feel in the game for mm. the the environment that I was in. I, there was yep. a bit of a disconnect. I don't know how to explain that. If that makes well, sense. I think that is so. I think you nailed on a really one of the biggest points of this game, and I think it'll be divisive. Right. Um, there's a lot of ways they could go, and the way that they chose to go is exactly what you said. You play a card, and instead of seeing the card represented. As a card on your screen, you get a building. Um, and then along the the side, you'll get an icon reference of right. what you've scored. So you still have the critical information in front of you, but the visual representation isn't physical cards, isn't right. you know, rectangular cards. And I I actually it took me a moment to get used to. I was kind of unsure, but the more I got into it, that color stream thing that you mentioned, Mandy, mm-hmm. I ended up really liking that. That is I a do. very nice little touch. Yeah. I think the art thing you're referencing, at least the way I process it, is mm-hmm. the art in Tides of Time is beautiful. In the card game, each right. card is a lovely work of art. They have basically taken those buildings and each building has unique architecture to it and they're each different which is a nice touch they don't necessarily inherently represent how they score what they are it's just a very pretty building right and that's okay but what you lose by moving the art out of a card moving that building off of a card rendering it in three dimensions and then placing it on a essentially a grid a board Mm -hmm. is you lose the setting Right. You lose the atmosphere around it. And so the the board, I'm going to call it a board, the digital sure. board, the, the area that these buildings are popping up on, it's kind of sandy looking and it has some art around the edges, but it's a tan, sandy grid. You can even see faint grid lines on it. Mm-hmm. And then the buildings plop down and then the buildings are very pretty. Right. But what you lose is all that surrounding art, all that setting art that all those buildings come from and the card. Exactly. So I think that maybe that may be where think- you're losing that. Yeah, no, that's exactly, I was going to say, that's exactly, exactly what it is. I feel like I'm losing it because it's so pretty. Like you see the Mm -hmm. card going, oh, this is nice. And, you know, if you've played the game, you know, the art's really nice. And then it goes into that very plain, basic, sandy kind of area. And the building itself is nice. The color streaming it. And then everything else is kind of just very plain. Mm -hmm. And I think you just, I lose that. And I'm the type of person I like to be involved in the game. And that really pulls me in. That might not matter to some people, Mm -hmm. uh, but that 
for me, that's important. But the game itself, I mean, it's easy to do, easy, easily explained. And I like the fact that I can easily play it. I like playing games against AI. Yes, I know. People think you're so social and oh my goodness. You know, I actually like playing against AI. (laughs) So for me, I find some of them difficult, but I don't mind, you know, it's just for Mm -hmm. me to get out and play the game itself. But overall, I enjoyed the game and I like that they were trying to do. I do miss that kind of that, that visual appeal with the environment of the game, but I, I did enjoy it. Okay. Well, for me, I I understood what you were saying about missing that atmosphere. It didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. After I adjusted to kind of the presentation of the buildings concept, totally doesn't phase me at all. And I can understand where you're coming from, but Mm -hmm. it doesn't phase me. Um, I will point out that there is an odd thing in the iPad. So I've played it both on my iPhone and the iPad. Okay. Where when you select a card, after you go into the second or third era, some of the card can get cut off by the edge of the screen. Mm. And it's it's an odd, it, it's very, it's getting more and more challenging to create apps because there's so many different screen um, ratios coming right. out that it's very hard to accommodate them all. And so I have a lot of sympathy for developers. But unfortunately, in my phone, it plays great. But in my, even though it's small, uh, right. in my iPad, you can actually go deeper into the eras and you'll find that the way the curve of the cards in your quote unquote hand oh, actually will, the, the cards on either end will be cut off by the screen. I think that's completely fixable and hopefully it gets updated. Um, and it's not a deal killer for me, uh, but something I found, um, something I noticed, um, I would really like, Of course, online play or something like that. Mm -hmm. I will say pass and play is delightful. And one of the benefits of Tides of Time is it's very quick. So this is the kind of thing you play with a buddy as you're standing in line for the movie to start or as you're sitting for the movie to start. You just pass back and forth and play a quick game with Tides of Time. And I think it works very, very well for that. Um, So for me, I really like it. I like Tides of Time in person. I like Tides in Time in the app. I think it plays well because of the the way the icons are laid out. After you get used to it and you know what they are, which is pretty easy to do, plays right. great on a small screen from my perspective. Some games don't translate great into yeah, a small no, it screen. Yeah, no, plays very nicely on a small yeah, screen. This one worked for me on the small screen. Um, some of the texts that are like, some of the, this is how this card score text, you have to just tap on the card and zoom in and read it and then it's fine. But um, right. yeah, I think, I think Portal did a lovely job with this one. I think they made some uh, bold and interesting choices that some people will enjoy and yeah. some people won't. But I like the app overall. I'm uh, playing it right now. So, yes, oh, I enjoy I'm <laughs> I'm so just glad finishing my up a quick game. Discussion is riveting, Mandy. Thank you. It's, it's, it's good. Mm hmm. All righty. So, Tides of Time, thumbs up from me on the app. Me too. QA. Mandy, I think people are getting used to us because the questions this week seemed very. <laughs> personal <laughs> oh are they geared toward certain things we've mentioned i know i don't know so I, I i i like this week's interesting so let's let's just dive in i've actually gotten this and i've seen you get it too we're getting asked a lot do you have a recommended laminator and dry erase pen i guess we have a reputation mandy yeah, i think you do and i've just kind of sailed in with a few of my options are you, you're, you're the Gilligan to my skipper. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Of roll and write boats. <laughs> um, definitely an Eric uh, reference there in yeah, some way. Exactly. <laughs> well, because we need more Eric. Always. Always. Um, I personally, I have a fellows laminator. I, Mandy, what do you have? Uh, which one do I have? It's in a, I'm looking at it right now. Is it Scotch? Potentially. Yeah. I think it's a scotch one that I have. I th- they usually have it on Amazon for like 20 bucks or something. And I got to tell you, it does the job quite well. Absolutely. I think where I land and I, this is how I always answer this question is the brand doesn't matter too much. You can get a good 20, $25 laminator and your set fellows, scotch, Amazon basics, mm-hmm. all of those laminators. Totally fine. What you really want to pay attention to is that you're getting a heat laminator that takes uh, what they call envelopes up yes. to five mils thick, M-I-L-S thick. Um, most will go three mils to five mils. Three is thinner, five is thicker. And five is really where you're going to max out on the inexpensive laminator. Now, if you go to a print shop, you can get like 
10 mil thick laminate. It's like industrial. It creates a hard board plastic coating. It's really, it, it's almost deadly. It's so. Oh, those cut. We have them at work. They are yeah. ridiculous. But for all of, for roll and write games, I also use my laminator to laminate some of the thinner player boards that you'll get in games sometimes yeah. or player aids. Mm-hmm. I'll laminate and stuff like that too. I just do to score give them a little sheets more too. Pressure absolutely score sheets all that good stuff um it's really the making sure that you get a laminator that'll that'll heat laminate up to five mils thick and and then that you're buying the appropriate thickness envelopes and again i've had success with scotch with fellows and with amazon basics laminate and it's been fine so just make sure you don't get matte if you want to write on it, that's a right. critical thing. If you're going to use them for roll and writes or score sheets or things like that, make sure you're getting a plain laminate. Don't get a matte finish laminate because it will not work for you in that capacity. Now, Mandy, mm-hmm. I do have a strong opinion about pens. Oh, I listen, I got the pens I'm using are the ones you recommended. So pff, you have at her with this one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when it comes to roll and write pens, and I want to point out, I've, I've, I didn't just find one and went with it. I like tested pens. Oh my God. So I ended up really liking the Stadler Lumicolor Correctable Pen. The things I like about it, it has a fine tip. So for, you can just write nicely with it. You can write a finer line. You can, your drawings are crisper. Your lines are crisper, that kind of thing. Um, It has an eraser in the cap, which is a nice thing just to have a little eraser on hand whenever you need one. I find that it doesn't smear very easily. Once you write, it dries quickly. And then if you brush your hand across it gently, it will not smear on you, which is a really nice detail. Um, And so, and also as long as you're not like crunching down on it, the, the, the pen point will stay sharp. It'll stay at a nice point unless you're really grinding down on it. Really, the only thing I have found uh, as a con on these Lumicolor pens is that I find the tips will form a skin quickly or the, the very tip will dry very quickly if you leave it uncapped as you're like mm-hmm. waiting for another turn. It, it's The pen isn't drying out. I haven't, I've had mine for a long, long time. They've been fine. You just have to rub it a little to kind of loosen that, the, the, the little section that dried off or just keep them capped in between yeah, turns and they're exactly. just fine. Um, but I've tried... I tried wet erase. I've tried multiple brands of dry erase. And and honestly, this is the one. They're they're slightly more expensive. I get about four for about eight to nine dollars in there. They come in multiple colors. Uh and so that's that's my big big tip. And and Mandy, you picked them up after I talked about them? Yeah, so I got them on Amazon and I was able to get them in the multicolor. So they come in a ton of colors, but uh, I think I ended up getting them in the black and then they come in like a red, green blue black combo and then they mm-hmm. have other kind of more pastel colors you'll have to go to like a staples or something if you want those they are expensive here so yeah i think if you yeah, get that them, is a downside to them yeah the cheapest i've seen for four is about 14 bucks uh you might be able to get them on sale at staples Ooh. and stuff but yeah i know they're expensive or you have to buy like a large i bought i ended up buying a bunch of them at work we were able to get some for the classes that i teach because i of course nice. use some roll and write games in my lessons <laughs> so yeah so we're able to pick them up and they're better if you can buy them in bulk so Yep, definitely. Very nice pens. So there's your definitive laminate and dry erase answer. (laughs) All right. So another question in the bag is, what is the best way to get involved in local gang groups in one's community? So this is a question that comes up a lot. And I know for myself where I am, I went, I just kind of went to a few different ones to see how I liked it because they have some that are at like pubs. So you can eat and play games. Then they have more kind of set game nights. So there's a, a website. Um, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, uh, but it gives you a listing of all the different kind of game gatherings they have in the community that you can attend. So uh, I kind of went through and tried a few of them. The pub scene one is not for me. It's too noisy. It's a bit darker. I just, it, it, that that wasn't my vibe. I prefer, like I have a regular game night. It's at a church. Um It's not the actual congregation. People just come to the church in that space. Uh, And it's a nice kind of smaller group where I am. And it's in my end of the city. It's five minutes from my house. And uh, I like it a lot. So that scene sits better for me. It's one of those things where I find you have to do kind of a trial and error to see what scene works for you. Yes. And then once you get kind of comfortable, then, you know, you might say, okay, this is the weekly group I'm going to. And then you may go to one-off events. But 
just trying to find that kind of group that's comfortable for you. So you have to do a kind of test, in my opinion. I don't know. What about you, Suze? I actually think you nailed it. I think that being willing and going into it, knowing that you may have to try a few to find the one that really fits with your game preferences, your personality style, things like that. I would also say scout ahead a little bit Mm -hmm. online as much as you can try to find as many as you can, whether it's on meetup or on Facebook groups on BGG, uh, local libraries, all just try to find all the resources available. Um, See if you can connect with people, like see what the little chat, or discussion is it within that group does it do they seem friendly do they seem like they're talking about games that you might like is this something that you want to put yourself out with i know that this is especially challenging um for people who are a little more introverted or right. who are less outgoing i'm fairly outgoing i'm fairly comfortable approaching groups of people i don't know um well i don't know if i'm comfortable with it but i'm willing to do it let's put it that way and I think that the more prep work you can do ahead of time can help ease that stress for people. So going online, oh, this meetup group, great. Hey, do what are you planning on playing? I have these three games I'm hoping to play. Do those sound good to anybody? Trying to make basically like almost form a little schedule for that mm-hmm. first foray, maybe even having people sign up for it so that you know you have some expectations set. Right. You you have a game that you know you're going to play. You have people you know you're going to engage with. So it kind of maybe shrinks it down from this bigger thing, this big unknown thing to something a little more comfortable. Uh, that would be the tip I would layer on top of what you said, Mandy, which I think is really smart about just knowing you're, it, there's going to be some trial and error. Um, right. But when you find that magic group, uh, it's pretty awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Planning is key. Absolutely. All right. This is the question that just... <laughs> cracked me up oh I'm, and, I'm dying to see this yeah so suzanne and mandy are you two really friends you seem like you have a lot of fun recording <laughs> together so did i hmm. never tell you i'm really good at acting i used to be an actress oh. <laughs> so you know you're good at, you're good at acting know. but you're bad at segues apparently mm-hmm. that's a thing <laughs> and you don't like space games. All right. I see where this is going. It's like that, eh? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mandy, uh, I think the first time we really met was a uh, trial by fire when yeah. we were at uh, Board Game Geek Con or yeah. Dice Tower Con. Board Game Geek Con, I think. And Tom asked us to do a video together out of nowhere. And I had known you online a little bit. Right. Not a lot, but we hadn't really even spoken much. But I knew you enough online to know I had a fondness for you, you know, already. And then we jumped into this kind of um, challenging discussion topic, which is basically about diversity in gaming, which is always um, uh, a challenging topic to have. (laughs) Yeah, there it is. No matter how you feel about how the video went, I know I felt very comfortable with you instantly having the discussion with you. And um, it was a very positive experience for me. And then we we started talking more and then getting to know each other more and spending more. And it kind of went from there. Now, whenever we go to conventions together, you and I are always roommates. (laughs) Yes. And it's funny because I was talking to somebody and maybe you feel differently and the truth will come out here. Yeah. All the, all the, the dirty laundry will be aired. But I was thinking about what Mandy and I do is we get tired <laughs> at the end of the day. We're tired and we go back to our room. We're usually in agreement about, Hey, let's, let's call it quits and just head up. Yeah. And we both, it seems like we always have the intent of, okay, Wash faces, put on PJs, pass out to a TV show on the iPad. Right. right? But I would say 60% or more of the time, three hours later, we're gabbing into the middle of the wee hours about whatever, (laughs) just shooting the breeze about everything and nothing. And then the next morning we regret it and we're very grumpy. It's so true. We say that, okay, we're going to get to bed early. And then blah, 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 blah. And it's literally a lot of, you know, emotion. And maybe it's just because we don't actually see each other in person unless yeah. we're at a convention, right? We're on the opposite ends of, you know, well, Canada, U.S. and then East and West and that whole thing. And I really do think that's what it is. And we are different, but we have a lot of the same kind of 
thoughts and opinions and mentality on certain things. So I think that leads to a lot of very interesting discussion and we just can't help ourselves. I don't know. Yeah, I, absolutely. We are very different people in many, <laughs> many, many ways. Exactly. But, um, but the other thing is, I we play a lot of games together now when we are at conventions together. Yeah. And I like playing games with you. Yes, I feel it's the fun. same. It's really because good. And- I get to knock over your perfectly <laughs> arranged rows of pieces and create chaos for you. And it's hilarious to me. And drop that video on Twitter. So if you want to check it out, it is somewhere <laughs> on Twitter. That's okay. I did drop one recently of me emulating so yeah, honestly, your emotions. Gaming is, we always, the Dice Tower talks about this. It's about the people who yeah. play the games. And without a doubt, I have many friends in my life that I've met through gaming and it's a blessing. And absolutely Mandy is a, not just a friend to me, but she is a close friend to me and we're separated by distance, but it doesn't matter in the age of the internet. And I'm very lucky and happy that we get to go to conventions together. So I get to see you a little more. I see you more often than some of my local friends, to be honest, (laughs) actually, we're kind of forced to from a time perspective. No, no, seriously. I I see you more than my, like my best friend who I've known forever. And half. I kid you not, it's hilarious, but absolutely. I I agree. Exact same sentiments. And it's great when I can just pop in a chat, send you a message. And it's like, answer me. No problem. Even if it's a crisis, I feel like I'm having and calm me down and we're good. So yes, we are friends and beyond, if you will. <laughs> and if you want the real scoop, you can send me an email at Suzanne at Dicetower.com and I'll give you the real laundry. I can hear you. <laughs> oh, uh, never mind. Okay. Well, oh, look, Mandy, there's one more question. <laughs> oh, okay. And what is that? Oh, okay, oh look at this. So <laughs> this is a good one because it, it does involve both of us. When is your new show going to start? <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who are don't know what the question's about, as part of the Dice Towers Kickstarter for the year, one of the early stretch goals was for Mandy and I to start a new streaming show featuring board game apps and digital board games where we will be playing against each other or with each other <laughs> online mm-hmm. and live stream and, and have the chat going and things like that. Um In fact, we had a little contest, a naming contest that we mentioned on the podcast uh, during a few episodes and had on a Board Game Geek Guild. So I think people are wondering, was it all a hoax? Was it all an illusion, Mandy? (laughs) It is happening. It's, it's, It's a work in progress. I mean, I've done streaming before. I do it on Monday nights as we're in a bit of a weird spot right now with that, but it's gaming like in person this is gaming online so you know we're trying to get everything set up um new cameras um we're looking at different platforms and this is where something i'm going to throw out if anybody's on discord i would really like to find out if you are because that is a platform we're looking at so if you are drop me a line uh we'll give you all the email in uh, at the end of the show where you can send that to but i would be very interested because that's one of the platforms we're looking at so it's a matter of just testing it out getting all the overlays and everything done properly because we don't want any glitches and we want to do some run throughs to make sure everything runs smoothly so 100% we're working on it it's a matter of just getting everything down so it works smoothly so soon i think that's the best answer soon <laughs> For sure. And, and, and we've made progress. In fact, Mandy taught me some after effects. So I'm, so I'm very proud of my new skill set. Thanks to, to Mandy's tutelage. And I appreciate that. So <laughs> did yeah, a great we're, job. We're, I'm excited. We're, we're gearing up. We've got a few more details, but um, I like your soon thing. Soon. It is, is we are recording on April 14th. So the official answer from April 14th is soon. It's soon. Yes. Oh, that's right. I thought you were saying April 14th. I'm like, wait a second. Isn't that today? Oh, wow. <laughs> Surprise, Mandy. Surprise. <laughs> so soon. All righty. I think we will call that an episode of the Dice Tower podcast. As always, we are looking for more questions. Feel free to, you know, ask about Mandy's singing routines that I get to listen to in the morning (laughs) over breakfast (laughs) at conventions, whatever you want to know, drop them in an email. My email is Suzanne at dice tower.com. And uh, mine is Mandy. That's Mandy with an I at dice tower.com. Thank you so much for joining us. It is a pleasure and privilege to have you listening to us talk about all the games that we get to play and love and, feel okay about (laughs) exactly (laughs) next episode episode 603 tom and eric continue to chug along with their alphabetic choo-choo with the best games that begin with the letter 
C. I ch ch choose you. <laughs> I like that. Classic. Until next time, I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Mandy Hutchinson. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Basil Memorial Fund is an organization dedicated to helping gamers in need. Learn more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackbasil.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Suzanne, Mandy, and Eric, with assistance from Itai Perez, Roy Canaday, Rob Searing, and Jeff Rademacher. Our theme is composed by Timothy Pinkham and arranged by Matt Bellier. And hosting is provided by Cool Stuff Inc. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. All right, it is that time again for Two Truths and a Lie. So let's jump right into uh, some of the things we wrote from last episode. So I once wrote a play about hard-boiled eggs. I've been published in three magazines, and I've been in a couple of movies. So if you said that I once wrote a play about hard-boiled eggs was the lie, you would be correct. As interesting as that sounds, I know, I unfortunately did not do that. Is it because it was just a little twist? Did you actually write a play about soft-boiled eggs? No, but that is a thought, actually. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Last episode, I said, I like pear jelly bellies. I like buttered popcorn jelly bellies. And I like watermelon jelly bellies. The lie is that I like watermelon jelly bellies. Ew. I I legitimately thought you were going to say the popcorn ones. Ugh. Oh, God. I, so pear and butter popcorn are my two favorite Jelly Belly flavors. My absolute two favorites. So there. You know, pear is great. Pear is beautiful. But uh, yeah, Juicy I don't know pear. about that other one. <laughs> Watermelon. Bleh. Oh, right. boy. Differences of the Jelly Bellies. All right. So for this week, some fun ones for you. And I'll go first. I rarely use my air conditioner in the summer. I watch a lot of the Graham Norton show. And I had a friendship end over a game of Uno. Whoa. Mm. <laughs> All well, right. You so. almost had a friendship end over Targi today, so. That's a fair point. So I sense a theme here. Hmm. What about you, Suzanne? <laughs> All right. Some of you, this is, I have a brand new puppy. And so if you heard some weird noises in the background, it may be her fussing. But uh, my two truths and a lie this week are. My Mm -hmm. new puppy is named Meeple. My new puppy is named Maple. And my new puppy is adorable. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) That's that's an interesting one. So I'm curious to see what people think of that. So there you have it, everyone. Good luck. Thank you to our sponsors at Renegade Game Studios. Check out Revolution of 1828 and all the wonderful Renegade games at renegadegames.com.